have your Bibles with you this morning. Be turning to uh, Philippians chapter two again. I heard a story about a uh, a man who joined a Catholic monastery. He uh, decided he wanted to be a monk, so he took a vow of silence. So I've heard of that. They didn't talk in this particular monastery. They they were uh, to keep silent for two years at a time. And every two years, they were to go before the priest of the monastery, and they were allowed to speak two words. Two words. Every two years, they were allowed to speak. So this, this guy spent two years in the monastery, and he went before the priest, and the priest said, okay, you can speak your two words. And he said, bed hard. He went back to his monasterial work two years later after not speaking for, for two years. Uh, uh, he went before the priest. The priest said, okay, you can speak your two words. And he said, food bad. Two more years went by, and uh, the guy comes before the priest again, and he stands before the priest, and he says, okay, what are your two words this year? He said, I quit. <laughs> and the priest looked at him and said, that's probably for the best. You haven't done anything but complain ever since you've been here. <laughs> My grandmother used to say that people are just gripey these days. And I think that's true. I remember when I was teaching, I, I had a girl who came into my class one day, and she was wearing this T-shirt, true story, wearing this T-shirt that said, complaining is my superpower. And I think she truly meant it. She was really good at it. Uh, but she complained quite a bit. But I truly believe that we live in a culture uh, where there's a lot of complaining going on. Maybe more than any other culture that's ever been across the course of human history. And I think part of the reason for that is because we place value on the, uh, the talent, you might say, of complaining. We have some people in this day and time that are actually kind of professional complainers. I think they go by the title activist. Uh, and there are many activists who uh, protest, who complain. Uh, against various topics, various subjects, various causes in the world today. You can even go to some colleges now and you can get a college degree in activism. A college degree in learning how to complain. They complain over political issues, they complain over moral issues, they complain over religious issues, financial issues, climate issues, uh, they complain about abortion or not abortion, they complain over uh, uh, feminist rights, animal rights, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, it doesn't matter. We have all of these people who are complaining and protesting all of the time. They, uh, they don't like the way the world is, yet they still complain about it. They, they just complain and they complain and complain. The world complains over and over again. But Scripture tells us we as Christians are not to be like the world. And this morning Paul tells us in verse 14, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Pray with me again just a moment, Lord. We thank you for these words, and we ask you to let them settle into our hearts and our minds. Make them clear to us this morning. Let us learn uh, from what you would teach us here in these, uh, these few words. Uh, Lord, there's a great problem with complaining in the world today, and we don't want to let that, uh, uh, that seep into our churches. So, Lord, uh, just open our minds and hearts to what you would teach us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Unfortunately, that does happen. Sometimes the ways of the world find their ways into the church. Over the years, I've heard uh, many stories of churches who have gotten in conflict. People are complaining, they're, uh, they're griping, they get into arguments, and I've heard of churches splitting over everything from... Uh, uh, something that simple as iced tea to, uh, to uh, the baby showers, fly poles. So churches, sometimes they get in disputes, they argue, they complain, and then they, uh, they run into trouble. When I say these things, I'm not talking about our church this morning. I want you to understand that I truly believe that we stand on pretty firm ground. We've had our issues in the past, but most of the complainers have left us, and and maybe we're better off for that in the long run. Uh, but there are complainers in the churches. There always have been. 
always will be some within the church who complain and dispute. But Paul makes it very clear to us this morning that this kind of complaining and disputing that he's talking about is really a sin. It's a sin before God. So this is really a serious matter. Even though I made light of it earlier, and we all do sometimes, this, every time I think a preacher comes to this point, he wants to make a little bit of light of it, but uh, we really need to take this issue of complaining and disputing very seriously because it is indeed a sin. Now this whole issue of complaining is not anything new in the world. The, the first complainer actually began with the first man, a fellow named Adam, all the way back to the beginning of the book of Genesis. And you might be thinking, well, well what did Adam have to complain about? In Genesis uh, uh, 3, verse 12, then the man said, the woman whom you gave to me, and he's talking to God, I was talking to God, he says, the woman whom you gave to, to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. So what was Adam complaining about? He was complaining about the woman. And you guys ever complained about a woman? Kind of been going on for quite a while. But Adam, he complained to God about the woman. He was, he was complaining about the woman. But listen who he was complaining to. He was complaining to God. To God. In a way, if you look at this, what he was doing was he, he was complaining about the woman, but who was he blaming? He was blaming God for making her. He said, you made her, God, and she's the one that enticed me to sin. So this has been going on for a long time. Cain complained to God. Moses complained to God. Jonah, the prophet, he complained to God a lot. So this is nothing new in the world. But understand, all of that complaining, all of that disputing is a sin. In Romans chapter 9, verse 20, Paul said, But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Who are you to complain and dispute with God? Near the end of the New Testament, Jude tells us about apostates. Apostates are, are people who come into the church and they, they profess faith in Jesus Christ. And then for one reason or another, they give up on their faith and they leave the church. Paul says, I'm sorry, Jude, uh, James, uh, Jude, Jude says in Jude 1 verse 6 uh, that these apostates are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust, uh, and they mild great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. So these apostates, uh, and really what they are, are false believers, people whose uh, faith really wasn't so real to begin with, but they, they come into the church and they put on a good show. They make people believe that they truly believe, but they want what they want when they want it. And they go out and they use their flattering lips, they use their flattering tongues to draw people to their side, and when they don't get what they want, they pitch their little fit and they leave the church. They're apostate. All of that grumbling, all of that uh, complaining again is a sin. Now, I, went, uh, I went hiking last week with a couple of guys I hike with very often. And as we were walking, we talk as we usually do. And one of the subjects that came up was how the Old Testament and the New Testament connect with each other. One of the guys was saying, I really, it's almost like two different, uh, uh, two different kinds of uh, religion going on there. He said, I really have a hard time making a connection between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. And I think this topic we're talking about here, this complaining and disputing, uh, we can use that to see one of the ways that the Old Testament and New Testament connect. You might remember the story of Moses and how Moses uh, went into Egypt and he brought the Hebrew children out as God had commanded him to do. And as soon as the, uh, the Hebrew children came out of Egypt, what did they start doing? They started complaining. In Exodus 15, verse 24, the people complained against Moses. In Exodus 16, 2, uh, then the whole congregation and the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Exodus 7, verse 3, uh, the people complained against Moses. Now, how, how did God respond to all of that complaining? In Numbers verse 11, chapter 11, verse 1. Now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. And so the fire of the Lord burning among them and consumed some of those on the outskirts of the camp. 
God was so upset and so angry at their uh, disputing and their arguing, their, uh, their complaining, that he actually burned to death some of those who were on the outside of the camp. Now, did that stop their complaining? No, it did. Numbers 14, verse 2, all of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. They kept their complaining. They kept right on going. How did God respond? In Numbers 14, verse 27, just a few verses afterward, God said to Moses, How long shall I bear with this evil generation who complained against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken, it has spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness, all of you who are numbered according to your entire number uh, from 20 years old and above. God says, I'm tired of your complaint. You're going out into the wilderness, and I'm going to leave you out there in the wilderness until everybody that's 20 years old and older has died. Even then, even then they kept complaining. In number 16, verse 40, 41, the next day, the next day the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron. And this time God was furious. Number 16, verse 44, God spoke to Moses saying, Get away from this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. He was about ready to take the whole bunch out. Moses talks him out of it. But there were a lot of complainers who died in those days. God, God didn't like that. God didn't want to hear their complaints. God was offended by their complaints and many died. Now let me, let me show you something in the New Testament, how we can tie this together. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 8, Paul writes, Nor let us commit, and he's talking about those same people, Talking about those people who came out of Egypt, uh, uh, these same Hebrew children. He says, let us, nor let us uh, commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. 23,000 died because they committed sexual immorality. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them did, and, and, and were tempted, and were destroyed by serpents. Uh, nor complain. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. And all of these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Paul says all of that recorded history that's in Scripture about those people coming out of Egypt and all of that business of their complaining and what happened to them, all of that was written as an example for us. All of that shows us how God really feels about complainers, about those who dispute, those who argue, especially with Him. He doesn't like it. And He will judge those who do it. It is a sin, and it's a serious sin before God. So Paul writes to us this morning, verse 14, do all things without complaining and disputing. Now what, what does Paul mean when he says all things? In order to understand that, I think we have to back up just a couple of verses. We go to verse 12 that we studied last week, where it says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, whatever it is that you're doing in your life to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, you need to do that without grumbling or disputing. If you were here with us last Sunday, you know uh, that we determined that when Paul says work out your own salvation, what he's saying there is making sure you're living an obedient life before God. That you're walking as Christians should walk. That you're living a life that is pleasing to God. We learned last week that God is working in us. Working in us to produce a God-pleasing life. And we, for our part, are supposed to be working on the outside to produce a God-pleasing life. And what Paul's saying there is in verse 12, he says, work out your salvation. And then in verse 14, he says, make sure you're doing that with the right attitude. Do it with a good attitude. Don't do it with an attitude that's grumbling and complaining. Obey the Lord without complaining about what he's telling you to do. And especially, especially don't, miss, uh, don't, don't argue with the Lord when He asks you to do things that you don't want to do under conditions that you don't like. 
Don't argue with God about what He tells you to do in His Word. And don't argue with God, dispute with Him, complain to Him about the conditions under which you are to, to do those things that He's commanded you to do. We all know life isn't going to be easy. God's promises that Jesus himself said, you'll know trials, you'll know tribulation in this world. So we know life isn't going to be easy. We live in a fallen world, and we live in fallen flesh, and things aren't going to always go the way we want them to go. But despite the conditions that we're, we're placed under, we are to do what God has commanded us to do without grumbling or complaining to him about uh, what he's asked us to do and the conditions under which we're to do it. Now, the King James Version of the Bible uses the word grumbling and disputing here. The New King James, which I'm reading from this morning, uses the word complaining and disputing. Another uh, translation of the Bible that I like to use sometimes, the English Standard Version, the ESV, uses the word grumbling and arguing. All of those things still boil down to uh, <coughs> the same meaning. It really means don't be a grouch. Don't have a grumbling, grouchy, bickering kind of an attitude. Don't let, let, don't let that be seen in you as a Christian. Don't be a mild content. Don't be overly critical. Don't be, don't be a divisive person within, within the church. If I put it in layman's terms, it basically means stop your belly aching. Quit complaining, quit disputing, quit arguing. As you're working out your own salvation, as you're working toward being more like Christ and being separated from your sin, as you're working through the process of sanctification, don't grumble and don't argue with God. Understand this. Because we're fallen flesh, living in a fallen world, the people around you aren't always going to act and behave and say and do and be the way you think they should be. And the world, because it has fallen around us, is not going to flow in the direction uh, that, you, uh, that you think it should always flow because it is a fallen world. But despite those things, do not argue, do not grumble, do not complain to God. God doesn't like it. It is a sin before God. But also we're not to dispute and complain and argue with each other. James tells us in James 5 verse 9, do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you, can get, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Listen to what, what we're just told there. James said, don't, don't grumble lest you be condemned. Now, that's that strong wording in the Bible. Whenever the Bible talks about condemnation, that's that pretty rough stuff. James is saying, don't grumble because the judge is standing at the door. God hears you. Sometimes we do these things in, a, in, the, in the back. You know, we're doing this in a way that we think nobody's hearing. And remember, God always hears. The judge hears what you're complaining, what you're arguing about. And James tells us he will judge. Peter agrees. Peter agrees with both the, uh, Paul and James in 1 Peter 4, verse 9. Peter says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Without grumbling without complaining. If you complain all the time and you argue all the time and you, uh, uh, you cause these divisions within the church all the time, you're going to be miserable all the time. It just goes with it. If you're one of those gripey, grumbling, grouchy kind of people, you're not going to be a very happy person. But if, if you go about working out your own salvation without grumbling or disputing. What's going to be the result of that is joy within the church. You're going to have a joy-filled church when the church is full of people who don't grumble and dispute as they're working out their own salvation. Now, I have to admit that there's a, there are complaints and then there are complaints. Some people would complain because they got bad service at a restaurant. That would be one complaint. Some people uh, would go a, a little step higher than that. They complain because they don't have enough money to buy groceries. Two completely different kinds of complaints there, right? But it's a whole other thing altogether if you're living in a country like Yemen where there isn't any food to buy. People are dying there of starvation by the thousands. So there's certainly 
more, uh, some complaints, I guess I should say, uh, on a human level that are more justifiable than others. But understand, regardless of that, it's still a sin before God. Even though we may justify it on human terms, it's still a sin before God. Why? Because all of that complaining doesn't fix anything, does it? It doesn't fix anything. Complaining is not going to help you get better service at a restaurant. Complaining isn't going to help you be able to buy groceries. Complaining isn't going to make there be more food in Yemen where there is none. In all of those cases, God would want us to take some other route other than complaining. If you don't like the service at the restaurant, don't go to that restaurant anymore. If you, if you don't have enough money to buy groceries, then remedy that some way. You cut off the cable TV, cut off a bill that you don't have. Uh, you know, but figure out a way to get some more money to take on a second job. All of that in Yemen, that's a whole other story because a lot of that's political. They won't even let a food come in. If an organization wants to send food down there, that uh, the politics are so hostile in there you, that they won't let foreign aid come in. So it's kind of a mess down there. In that case, the best thing we can do for them is pray. Pray that the door will be open, that aid will be able to come in. Yet Paul commands us in verse 14, do all things without complaining or disputing. <clears throat> complaining and disputing won't fix it. I want us to look this morning at some of the practical reasons why Paul says we, could, we should do this. Some of the reasons that Paul says why we should not uh, complain or dispute. And the first one Paul says in verse 15 is that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault. So the first reason we don't want to complain and dispute is for our own sake. Understand that for your personal sake. When you stop grumbling and complaining, then you become, Paul says, blameless and harmless, and that proves that you are indeed a child of God. And that's what God wants from His children. God doesn't want us to be complainers. God doesn't want us to be in constant dispute with one another. God wants us to live our lives in a way that is spotless in a way in which we will not be blamed for any sinful act. He wants us to be so pure that we are harmless. He wants us to be above reproach. He wants us to be flawless. He wants us to be without fault. Why? Because we are children of God. And we want to reflect our Father in heaven. We want to be like our Father, don't we? 2 Peter 3, verse 14 says, Be diligent to be found by Him in peace without spot and blameless. One of the ways that we do that is to avoid complaining, to avoid disputing. If you gripe and if you, if you complain, if you argue, then you have sin and you're not going to be blameless. You're not going to be harmless. So one of the reasons that we want to not argue and not complain, to not dispute, is for our own sake. But there's another reason. There's another reason Paul lays out here for us. We don't want to argue and dispute and complain for the sake of unbelievers. This is about our testimony. Again, the whole passage this morning, verse 14, says, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. As with most things that we do, this issue of complaining and arguing, it affects our testimony for Jesus Christ to the world. This is probably the most important reason why we don't want to complain, why we don't want to dispute to the Great Commission that our Lord Jesus tells us that we are to go out and make disciples of all nations. And it's really hard to do that, to fulfill that commission when we're arguing and complaining and fussing among ourselves. We as children of God are to be the light of God in a very dark place. And we can't do that very well if we're griping and complaining all the time. Look, our, our testimony for Jesus Christ is really based on two things. 
First of all, our conduct, how we act. And second of all, the words that we speak. That's really our testimony for Jesus. How we act and what we say. Our character, how we act, plays a very uh, important part in the testimony that we, we uh, portray uh, to this uh, crooked and perverse generation that's around us, as Paul puts it. And what we say also has a very good uh, impact, uh, uh, an impact on that same crooked and perverse generation. Paul saying to us this morning, if we want the words that we say about Jesus Christ to carry any weight in the crooked and perverse generation around us, then we also need to pay attention to how we act. Because they're not going to listen to the words that we say if our actions don't back up the words that we speak. And one of the ways that our actions should back up the words that we speak is we don't argue and complain and dispute among ourselves. This church and every church exists in the middle of a perverse generation, a crooked and perverse generation. Amongst all of the mess that's going on in the world, the church is the only clean spot. We are a light shining in the world. Paul tells us in Philippians uh, 2, verse 15, that we're to be blameless, we're to be harmless, we're to be without fault. That's how we shine our light in the world. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6 says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, the very God that created light in the book of Genesis, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, verse 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Live as children of light. Speak as children of light. Act like a child of the light. When we fail to be blameless and harmless and faultless, we're just dim in the light. We're putting a bushel over, over the light, as Jesus once said. If we don't walk the way uh, that Christians are supposed to walk, we're putting the light out. Through our personal character, how we act to the world, how they see us acting, interacting with each other, has a great, uh, a great impact on our testimony for Jesus Christ. But so do our words. And that's what Paul says in the next verse, verse 16, holding fast the word of, of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Hold fast to the word of life. The word of life. What's the word of life? And that's the gospel. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the good news that Jesus Christ came into the world and then he died as a sacrifice, as a payment for our sin, and we are forgiven. That he rose from the dead for our justification and he went into heaven to make a place for us so that we can have eternal life. All of that's the good news. That's the word of life. Paul says we're to hold fast to that. Hold fast to that. Now the Greek word in there, when they talk about holding fast, they weren't saying clutch it and keep it to yourself. When they said hold fast, what they were saying was grab hold of it and hold it out for others to hear. To our words, what we say regarding our Lord Jesus Christ and our actions, how we live and how we act as Christians uh, play a great part in our testimony for Jesus Christ. And one of the ways that all of that's seen in our life and heard in our life is how we communicate. We don't complain and we don't dispute. So point number one is, is that we should not complain and dispute for our own sake. Point number two is that we should not complain and dispute for the sake of unbelievers. But there's a third point Paul makes here, and I want to show that to you quickly as we close this morning. Paul says, don't argue, don't complain, don't dispute for your pastor's sake. Some of you are kind of looking like, does the Bible really say that? <laughs> is that really in there? And I tell you it is, look at what Paul says in verse 16. He says, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Paul says, look, if you'll obey this command, to not uh, uh, dispute, to not, to not complain, 
if you obey this command, be born of blameless and harmless and, and, and faultless in the world. If you'll shine uh, the light of the gospel upon this crooked and perverse generation uh, that we're living in. He says, if you'll do that, I'll rejoice. I'll rejoice and I'll, I'll be glad. He says, I'll know that the work that I've done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ hasn't been a, a work that's done in vain. Now understand, Paul didn't do that. Paul didn't do that selfishly. He didn't say those words. Paul wasn't looking for a pat on the back here. He wasn't looking to make himself feel good. What he desired was that when Jesus Christ comes back, uh, that the, the work that he had done would be pleasing to Christ. I think all pastors feel that way. All pastors feel that way, and I think that's true of this pastor as well. If you'll do these things, if you'll do these things, if you'll not grumble, and if you'll not dispute, if you'll be harmless and blameless and faultless in the world, if you'll shine uh, the light of the gospel in this crooked and perverse generation, uh, then I'll rejoice, because I know when Jesus Christ comes back, He's going to understand that the work that I've done here at Midland Baptist Church wasn't a work that was done in vain. To understand, we do this, this command. We, we, we obey this command. We don't grumble. We don't dispute for, the, for our own personal sakes, for the, uh, for the sakes of, uh, of the unbelievers in the world, for those in that crooked and perverse generation. We do it for the sakes of pastors, for church leadership, so that we know that the work done in the church isn't a work that's a vain work. When we do all of that, the world looks inside and they see the church and they see peace and they see uh, they see the children of God, how they interact with each other and they want to be a part of who we are. They look in, they see arguing and complaining and disputing, they're not going to want any part of that. So again, this is really about our testimony. We, we need to make sure that uh, none of that comes into our church. We don't want to let any, any more arguing or complaining or disputing seep in. We want to be the children of God that we're called to be. And I understand one final thought that I need to address before we, uh, uh, we get into this. We're not talking about doctrinal issues or issues of morality. We're not talking about bending to the world or compromising in any way. Scripture tells us we are to boldly stand up for those things. That's not arguing and disputing. But when it comes to just petty things, grumbling things and gripey things, those are the kinds of things Paul's talking about here. Don't let that seep into the church. We can have discussions about moral issues and uh, doctrinal issues that come into the church without being complainers and disputers about it. Doesn't mean we're always going to agree with one another. But we certainly don't have to be... Uh, Grumbly, grouchy people. I, I've witnessed times when people were grabbing hold of the backs of pews at business meetings, not at this church necessarily, but turning red in the face and gritting their teeth and ready to explode. That should never happen in church. It should never happen in church. Yeah, you may not agree with everything that's going on, but that doesn't mean you have to be a complainer and a disputer and a, a, a grouch. <laughs> we don't want to let that ever come back into our church. So uh, that's the message this morning. Next Sunday, next Sunday we're going to step away from the book of Philippians. We're going to go ahead and start working our way toward Easter. Uh, I'm going to take a little different approach to my Easter sermons this year. Uh, next Sunday, being the week before Easter, I really want to spend some time talking about the crucifixion, but I don't want to give you the normal, the uh, traditional, I guess I should say, message about uh, about uh, the crucifixion of Christ. I think we've all heard that message. But what I really want to concentrate in uh, on next week whenever I approach this is not just the crucifixion but the glory, the glory of the cross of Christ. So we're going to look at the crucifixion from a little bit different uh, angle, I guess you might say, next Sunday. And I think the Sunday following, I think we're probably going to do the same thing. We're going to look at the resurrection of Christ as we should on Easter Sunday. But we're going to take a little different approach and we're going to look at the, the glory of the resurrection. Really what we're going to look at is what these, uh, what these events mean to us. 
What did the what did the cross of Christ mean for us? What did the resurrection of Christ mean for us rather than just looking at the, the historical events as they unfold? So I look forward to those uh, those Sunday messages and I hope you'll all be here for them. And we are entering into a season where all Christians should be diligent about being into churches and celebrating celebrating the salvation that we've received because of the events that happened all those years ago. So uh, I hope you're planning to be with us. Uh, with that said, I guess we'll have a closing song and a closing prayer. Let's stand and sing uh, number 499. All right, bear with me.